AAE. We got it. We hit, we're now recording. So now, now it's for prosperity. So it has to be perfect. Um, again, I'm the Executive Director of Equity Gallery. And thank you all for coming. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about Equity Gallery for those that don't know who we are. We're on Broom Street uh, down the Lower East Side. The gallery has been in operation since 1947. And we started expressively for artists to support other artists. So I think it's uh, has a unique mission and we have kept it going brilliantly through this uh, COVID mess. Uh, and that brings us currently to our exhibition uh, by Eric Holtzman, uh, which is called Thinning the Veil. And they're here tonight. The artist himself, I kid you not, is here tonight. And, uh, and Ben Pritchard, who uh, curated the show, and also Jonathan Goodman, who is an art writer, uh, who has, uh, has uh, written about Eric's work before and his intimate knowledge of his work. So uh, what I'm gonna do, how we're gonna work tonight is we're gonna have a little panel discussion about that show, just a conversation, about what Eric's aims are, what his hopes are, uh, how, how Ben informed the exhibition and whether Jonathan thinks it held up and uh, more or less. Uh, and then we'll take some Q&A from you guys. So as the evening progresses and we start talking about things, you can uh, just load your questions into the chat and I'll, uh, and I'll ask, I'll answer them for you or pitch them to the group and we'll answer them. So, uh, so what I want to ask now is if I can have um, each one of the panelists, Eric, Jonathan, and Ben, just maybe introduce yourselves, talk a little bit about yourselves and what you're up to these days, uh, where you come from, so the audience gets a bit of an idea what your lens is. So we're going to start with Eric, then we'll move to Jonathan, and then we'll go to Ben. So again, Eric, you're up. I, hi, good evening, everyone. I'm um, um, from born in the Bronx, grew up in the suburbs in Yonkers, and um, went to quite a lot of art school, and uh, Tyler and Yale and Skowhegan and blah, 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 studio school even for a summer. And, um, so I've been living in Soho now since 1979 in this loft and I've been very lucky to be able to be here. I have a nice space and um, uh, I don't know how much, whether you, that maybe that's enough for now. Is that enough for now? Yeah, that gives me a nice little picture. We're all jealous that you live in a loft in Soho. That's what, yeah, I can feel we're all kind that. of jonesing for that, that. right? Like, exactly. Um, like, and, well, we're all like some ten years late, some thirty, some never. Um, but you, you know, I, I, you glossed over the fact that you were went to Yale, and I know that that's really informs your story, and especially with with Held, who you study with, and we'll come back and with Al and uh, William Bailey and Lester Johnson. The, the, they're all they were all very beautiful, great painters and great teachers. And before that, I had another great teacher who really, in undergraduate school, who I love to mention, his name is John Moore, a wonderful painter. And he and his wife really kind of adopted me. And I was really up for adoption at the time. Right. And now Ben has adopted you. But before we get to Ben, let's move Always over to you. Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Hi. Hi, my name is Jonathan Goodman. Uh, uh, I'm both a, a quite an active art writer and a poet. Um, I studied English and German literature at Columbia and then went to grad school at Penn where I took language courses in medieval English literature. So I read Beowulf from the original and, old and other Old English and Latin and Middle English. Um, uh, but uh, I actually found my voice when I was writing about art and I started writing about art in Philadelphia after I'd left grad school. And I am from the New York area. I grew up on Long Island, but moved to uh, uh, Brooklyn before Brooklyn was Brooklyn uh, many years ago. Uh, and uh, um, <clears throat> have been in New York now for over 30 years after spending five years in Philadelphia. Um, uh, uh, as an art writer, I write for the, the Brooklyn Rail uh, white Hot and Two Coats of Paint, um, also Art Fuse, and then two magazines, one in, uh, four magazines, one in Italy and one in uh, Madrid, one in one in Madrid. And as a poet, I've read a lot in and around. Uh, 
and as a oh, poet, yeah. I've read a lot in and around uh, in galleries in New York. And uh, I received a, a grant from the American Academy of, uh, of uh, Arts and uh, Letters so uh, 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 up and uh, and, and uh, I've always liked Eric's work and um, want to support him. That's and, me uh, about being toxic. I'm sorry. So I'm going to ask, sorry, can I ask everybody to mute yourselves? I'm trying to make sure I'm going to do the list and muting. Yeah, it's so just way. put your all selves on mute, right? Thanks so much. Okay, Jonathan, sorry. Just to finish, I, 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 uh, I'm, I write a lot about uh, 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 contemporary art. Uh, I'm also equally interested in modernism and from that point, and even earlier, but I, I, I haven't had scholarly training, so I don't write that much about, about uh, you know, Renaissance or, but uh, um, I think Eric's work is really an interesting bridge between, uh, between, uh, current ideas about a uh, landscape art in uh, maybe 19th century French landscape painting. Yeah. Great, John, thanks, thanks so much. Jonathan, for years, he just retired actually, was uh, working at Pratt, I understand, yes. and was teaching artists how to write. And for that, you have a seat waiting for you in heaven, because that <laughs> is, uh, that's yes, a- That's a long front. Um, I found what I found is, is that two things. One, that the, that the students at Pratt have become progressively uh, better skilled, how, why or how, I don't know. Maybe the high schools are doing a better job in writing, but um, also I really like working with artists because they're always intuitively smart and, they're, and if they're willing to pick up uh, uh, technical skills in writing, they often do very well. So it was a pleasure working with the students. Mm. Yeah, Jonathan, so what we'll have to do in the near future is have you do some writing workshops for equity and help artists with their artist statements, which is- I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to do that. Great. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Okay, now on to the, our man, our, our man man here, Ben Pritchard. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Ben. Um, uh, yeah, I grew up here in Detroit. I'm back in Detroit now. I um, uh, went to the, I had a whatever wild, wayward youth that um you know led me to down various paths and i discovered painting um ended up at the art institute of chicago um and i graduated after one year of just painting and i and i knew nothing literally zero so i so i found my way to brooklyn um went to the new york studio school uh, spent a couple of years there um sort of started to kind of crawl towards a sort of sense of identity somehow um and then and then i started working there and that's where i really i think started to learn <laughs> learn learn what i didn't know and how to separate my, myself from myself as they say um and then i ended up going to graduate school um at the royal academy of arts in london um yeah it was during the bush years i didn't want to be in america and i was like ah oh, i'll go to graduate school and i applied to one graduate school and it was the RA schools and it was a great three-year program um, in London, um, super rigorous, um, but also kind of wild, you know, bohemian sort of scene. Um, so I, anyhow, I spent five years there and then I came back to New York and um, yeah, I've been uh, between New York and um, Detroit um, here since then. So since uh, what, 2011. And uh, yeah. I'm happy to have had this opportunity to, uh, you know, to work with Eric, you know, um, I don't even know how I know Eric, but I've, I've always admired his work and this, having this opportunity present itself was just a, you know, um, I would say my general interest is in, is in how does one maintain artistic practice over decades? How does one continue to grow and expand um, as an artist, as a human being, you know, over, over the decades and Eric's a great example of that. So, so. I'm honored to uh, to have been a part of this um, with you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ben. And we met at the studio school. Did we meet there? Yeah, yeah. But I didn't study with you. What's that? Uh, no, I, I don't think. So. Yeah. Okay. But I was teaching, and you were. I don't Probably know. when I was working there or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was crazy. Great, Ben. Well, well, Ben, you know, did a very successful show with us at Equity Gallery, and has been a big supporter of the gallery, and introduced the work of Eric to me uh, during his show, said, you've got to show this guy. And I was very excited about the work. And then we just were waiting for COVID to sort of unwind. 
so we can get to Eric's studio and see his work. Um, so what I want to talk about, because the evening is called On Thinning the Veil, and, and that title grabbed me right away. And I thought that, you know, is a good of place as any to begin talking about the show. So Eric, can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, that title and how, you know, that title informs the work and what were you thinking about when you took that title? And I think it's, uh, yeah, I'm intrigued by it. I never thought I'd have to explain it, but here goes, I'll make an effort to do that. Uh, the momentum of my life, the um, forward momentum of my life, you could sort of say has been to try to thin the veil. Another way of saying that is to say that um, um, what, I have to preface everything. The way I think is really the way only, maybe only suits me. So if anybody, you know, um, I'm not trying to, I don't mind converting. I do have an evangelistic streak, but on the other hand, I don't really want to convince anybody of anything. But this is how I have come to view the world, which is basically that we've been sold uh, something which isn't true. Uh, and it's one of the fundamental aspects of the world that we live in, which is that we are separate from spirit. When I call, when I talk about the veil, I'm talking about the thing that separates us from, from the spirit. You know, some people might say God, some people make, you know, the Native Americans would say the, 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 the great mystery, you know, it doesn't matter really what you call it. And the only way I've found comfort in my life and, and as I, you know, go through life, it's become much, much more um, of a, um, you know, there's no, it's unequivocal. You know, there's no, there's no, there's no in between. The only comfort really, uh, or the main comfort is, is, is in spirit. And, 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 uh, and even in my relationships with uh, uh, my fellow man, I really try, as somebody I once said, that in a, in a, even in a romantic relationship, there's, um, there's really three. And I know this now because I've made so many messes in my life, but there are really three components to it. You know, it's the two humans, and then there's, um, you, you kind of need always to refer to a, I guess you could say a higher power. And, you know, just to wrap this whole exposition up, uh, that higher power, another, another word for it is love. Great. Jonathan, what are your thoughts on the title? Did, what, what did you think? Oh, yes. the, the I was, was going to exactly. Exactly, I was going to comment on that because as a writer and as also um, as someone very deeply interested in, 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 in lyric, lyric writing, thinning the veil is a, is a beautiful metaphor. And uh, it, it really might be, a, I might steal it for another, for a piece of writing of my own. Um, beautifully, beautifully said. Um, the other thing that, that if we can tie it specifically to, um, to Eric's work that sometimes I feel when I look at his work that it's as if there's a mist or a veil in front of the imagery. And that, that, that what Eric does is he makes it thin enough so that the mystery that exists in front of the imagery is just transparent enough to give way to the actuality behind it. Beautiful, wonderful. I was, when I first saw the title, I was thinking about um, Renaissance altarpieces, mm -hmm. right? That there is, you know, that, and then uh, the Albertian veil, right? The idea of, you know, sort of the, the surface and behind that exists the divine or the truth, right? So beautiful. I, I, wanna, I, love the I do want to make the point though, that, that, um, that uh, Eric's work 
uh, he, he invokes spirituality, but that Eric's work is very much about the real world and about, about, about the landscape and about trees and branches and, 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 and foliage. Foliage especially is a big deal for Eric. And uh, um, I think it's important that we uh, anchor our perception of his work in that reality. Wonderful. How about you, Ben? What did you think about the title and uh, how it related to the work? Um, yeah, I think it's great. Um, I, I, I think I badgered Eric, you know, to get more specific and honest with himself about, you know, his paintings, because I think, you know, he wanted to call it the show paintings or, you know, something completely prosaic like that to me. And, and I'm, I think that the more personal we are with ourselves that, you know, Eric's a, the, a fantastic example of this, of someone who's constantly working to be as honest as he can with himself and his own metaphysics and his own physics. And, and, and I want, I want, I want him and, and all of us really to bring that to bear, you know, on, on the, the, the larger painting culture, you know, um, to share who we are um, in that embodied sense, you know, and, and, and it, it sounds kind of hippie and kind of it's it's kind of maybe ick to some people, but I think that's a very crucial, um, you know, aspect of, about the work that that doesn't really get talked about a lot, um, and and probably for good reason, you know, for some people. But I, I like to kind of dive into, you know, the metaphysics, you know, um, things that are are outside the realm of just the pure practical because. Yeah, painting is, you know, it's a very simple ancient practice, you know, paint, canvas, you know, it's like cooking, pigment, binder, um, but then what you do with it and how that connects to you, um, you know, is, is what is mutable over time. And, you know, and, and his entire show, you know, it was a shock to me to see all the different work that he'd done. Um, I thought of Eric as, as a landscape painter, as a guy who goes out and paints trees and and when you see the show, you know, you see it, there's a lot more going on. There's a whole kind of, you know, there's a tough narrative that, that emerges from, from his work. And that's what I'm interested in. So, yeah, I think it's a great title. Great. You know, I had a question that I'm going to jump and go to another one, because I think Ben's point about um, the, the varieties of genres that are in the show are, are rather remarkable. And they're all very well done. So, you know, what you're expecting was, well, we're going to get a landscape show, but what you wind up getting are, there's portraits in there, there's still lives in there, there's work that almost looks totally abstract. So we've got a, a and Ben had a lot to do with that. Ben acted as a curator. So I'm going to ask um, Ben and uh, Eric and Jonathan just to talk about that, about the, you know, the, the I think the, the show holds, well, it's my gallery, so I'm, you know, so I'm probably not the right person to ask, but um, I think it really holds, even though we're crossing all these genres that might be jarring in other instances. And we all have visited shows where it is sort of like, I'll take everything I made in the last 20 years and ram it in there. But that's not what you see. What you see is there, you know, there might be a narrative there. There might be something else going on that just gets kind of teased out through these genres, right? And, and some of the works, um, like the, the Venetian figure, um, you know, it's, it's interesting that's thrown in there. So Eric, why don't you just talk a little bit about that, about the, the decision to, that you made with Ben to sort of, you know, put a little bit of different and how you work, do you work like that? Do you, do you, uh, you know, do you feel you're sort of cognizant and, and verbal with all these different genres? Well, before I skip, go to that exactly, I just want to skip a tiny little bit back, which is, sort of related, but um, to say like, like Ben and I are very, very different painters. And I'm very grateful to be living in this time when, you know, despite how we eventually, you know, what we eventually make to bring to the world, um, you know, it could be very different. We, we all see, we are all coming from some I mean, what Ben was saying before is what I'm trying to say was very beautiful and, it, and, it, and it's a common root for a lot of, there's so many really wonderful different kinds of painter, painting going on. And, and that, um, anyway, I just wanted to say that. And as far as the other, the question you just asked, uh, Michael, um, 
I think at its root was uh, um, an idea I had very early on about the French painters in the late 19th century, how in a sense they painted their lives and that they could move from genre to genre and um, you know paint the breakfast table and then go paint a mountain. And uh, I, I really wanted to be that kind of painter and to have a, um, a sort of a approach to painting that, that, you, that, 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 um, that could bring all of it together uh, 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 and and um, to continue that thought, uh, I think now when I go to work, I'm sort of like maybe because I've lived in many as, enough years. Although I don't feel like an old guy, I've lived enough years so that my vibration. I'm sort of used to my own ethos or my own vibration or something, you know. So I kind of have an idea of what something's supposed to feel like when it's done, whether it's an apple or a tree or a face. Although, you know, it does change and, the, and there are some paintings in there that came really quickly, um, you know, a day, maybe two, maybe three. Um, and then some paintings that evolved over, you know, um, what's that word I'm looking for, eons. Uh, long, 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 way too long, you know, but that, but mostly that's because I don't really know how to do, I don't really have a, especially now, I'm going to say, uh, I hope I don't go on too long. If I do, I, I told Michael before to kick me under the table. I don't any, I, when I was younger, I, I was more of a conceptual painter, which I think is more modernist and, and more in a way, the way I was trained and more like the teachers I had, being conceptual to me, what I uh, could say is that you, you sort of have a set of, um, you have a set of um, boundaries or, and conditions and you function within them and you execute. It's more like executing. But in the last section of my life, I don't have anything like that anymore. And it's really all by, it's touch by touch um, feeling. It's all feeling, it's all experiential. I don't really know how to do. I have some chops. I have some. I have some moves I can make, you know. But how and when it gets there, how it gets there, that's a whole. That's a. I don't know. Did I answer the question? Then? Yes. Oh, you, you wonderfully. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I I love the idea that you're painting life, and mm -hmm. and that's not limited to any sort of given construct defined by a style or a genre. Great, yeah. wonderful. What do you, Eric, John, if you want to jump in on that question? Sure. Um, what comes to mind for me, since um, I've, been, I've been writing as, a, as someone describing contemporary art, but also with a strong interest in, in, uh, in what's behind it, the history behind it, is that, is that uh, Eric's comment about 19th century, late 19th century French painting, I think should be emphasized. And then also, the other thing is that is that as as an art writer who's trying to uh, trying to write uh, incisively about Eric's work, um, what comes to mind is trying to define what it is that connects the different genres within uh, so that so that there's a unity, right. and that's what I'm impressed with is that that uh, the works may may address many different kinds of genres within landscape, you know, or, or different kinds of subject matter. But there's always the unity of, 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 of the brush mark of the hand. And um, I think this is the sign of, 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 of a gifted artist. Great, that's wonderful. What about you, Ben? What's your thought on, um, you know, when you curated the show, what, what were you thinking? What, what drew you to certain works when you were in the studio? How did you make those decisions? I know it wasn't just because this looks nice next to this, because you're, you're a thoughtful dude. So you want to share a little bit about that? Um, well, given the limitations of the space, because initially, obviously, I wanted to let Eric work really large, and we weren't we weren't able to do that. Um, and that was my dream. And, and we, we had one pretty good medium sized painting that that I think was really successful. I believe it's the second one on the left, as you enter in and that to me is, is a great example of, a you know,
Oh, Ben, you just cut out. Ben, you ju your voice just cut out. Yeah, I think he's freezing there. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Is it working? Yeah, you're back now. You're okay. Good. You're good. Okay. Um, um, the first painting on the left when you walk in was the, the it's a three three figures. It looks like it was painted in Pompeii or something. And that was when I walked into his studio and saw that, I was like, oh, this show is going to be different than I anticipated um, because that, I didn't know what to make of it. I had no kind of reference point for it. It seemed very different from my, my idea of, of Eric's work. Um, and then, you know, we got into it with the Venetian figures, you know, the Punchinello, um, the portraits, you know, and it just, you know, it, this whole kind of unpacking of Eric's world, you know, started to happen. And, and you know, it was, it was surprisingly joyful and easy to put it all together um, once we got it in the space. But before then, I had no idea what was happening. Um, those first three figures were the ones that kind of, really struck me that wow something else is really happening here um and i spent a lot of time with that painting and, and um i still have no idea what it, where it comes from or what it's about um if it's an art historical reference but it feels very personal very psychological to me um and that led me into the whole the whole show great uh for those that, that haven't seen the show in person i urge you to really try the some work looks really good online, work that sort of traffics in high curoscuro, a lot of sort of dark and lights. There's an there's a extreme subtlety and layering and velveturas to Eric's work that doesn't translate at all online. And, and the, I, the response I consistently heard in the gallery, because I listen like all good politicians, to what my audience is telling me when they come to a show is they couldn't pinpoint when the work was made. Like it felt to them both contemporary and archaic. And archaic is an interesting word for me because I think it's what I'm hearing Ben talk about. It's sort of this, you know, not that something's old, but that it's somehow uh, psychically primitive. That there's, there's sort of, and that sort of is one of the narratives I saw teased through the show, which is sort of uh, this timelessness. Like when was this painting made? Is it 19th century? Is it? So that it begs the question, how does one get to this point? How does one in 2021 paint like that when we're in a world that um, Eric's loving, he's cavelling. He's him cavelling because I'm asking him a question. He wants to I'm answer. cold. Oh, I thought I was getting you excited. Um, I, that too, that too, that too. That too. You know, uh, you know, in a world teased by spectacle, right, and flashes in the pan, the idea of something taking eons to paint is entirely radical. That's a real radical stance. So Eric, I want you to talk a little about, you've unpacked this a little bit more, but talk a little bit more about your process. Talk a little bit about more about how you paint, like how you arrive at your imagery. You know, when does it start to feel right and click for you? And, and what that damn painting is with those figures that have been all wrapped up. <laughs> Right. Well, well to start there and work it out. And then okay, I'm going to hear okay. from Jonathan. Okay. Right. I, I think it's real that painting particularly that Ben's talking about is really, really unclear. And it was just in a nice moment. And I thought if I go, you know, this happens to all of us. If you go on, you're going to, it's going to be a different painting. And uh, maybe it'll be better, but it'll be different. And I left it. And I think I'll go back to that, that same, um, that same theme again. But the, what that was is from, I made that from three drawings that I made about 25 years ago that I've had, that I've been trying to work up the courage to make into a, a, a painting for about that long. Hmm. And um, the three, there are two women on either side and a man in the middle. And it's sort of a switcheroo on, on the source, you know, and, and I, I don't know how many source paintings there are. I only know the Courbet one where the, the woman is the source and the woman really is the source, but the those three drawings were, they weren't made together, but they were put together 25 years ago. And they, they had something to do with the way I felt when I was a, 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 a father for the first, well, first and only time. Um, and uh, I felt like I was, um, I felt, I, I, don't, I hope nobody, 
doesn't like what I'm saying, but I felt like I was carrying the show and getting no credit for it. So there I was, you know, I felt, there was the man in the middle with a, with a jug of water and that was uh, symbolically carrying the, you know, the source and on either side was a woman and um, you really can't see quite what they're doing in the painting as it stands now because it's very vague. And I was just starting to rough it out when I left it. Um, the, the woman on the be left, there's also a, a child, a sleeping child next to her. As far as the other questions go, how does the, how to, what is it all about in a sense is what the question is, I think. And um, I think the clearest answer may be, uh, I could answer it clearly, most clearly through these two portraits that are in the show. And those two portraits I worked on for, um, I think about three years. And the, what I realized as time went on was that I didn't want you to see just the girl in the portrait is a pretty girl. And, but I didn't want you to see her as just that. And I guess I didn't want I didn't want, I guess I, there's something is an event. I do have an agenda, you know, and I don't really quite like that about myself, but I, but I do have one. And what I really wanted to uh, get across somehow, and what, what Jonathan was talking about in these veils and, you know, and, and time and all these things, I really wanted you to see that when you looked at this woman, in this painting, this young woman in this painting, you're not really just seeing her, you're seeing perhaps countless lives, countless lives where she had maybe in another life been a, um, she'd been, um, you know, she, on one life she could have given birth on a battlefield and been, you know, the, 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 her and her child could have, lives could have ended like that, like that. She could have been a countess in another life. and. In another life, she'd be a male. In other words, what I'm trying to show in these paintings is that we have, I don't know. It's like what paintings, you know, if you go back to, to, to portraiture before modern times, you saw through the face into, uh, um, you know, and a lot of time, you saw through, you saw through the, the surface and you, in a way seeing into time and it's all at once. You see what I'm trying to say? I don't know if I'm expressing it that well. Very well. There's that. That's not the only part. But what's really important, uh, I sound like Monty Python. The main thing, no, the two main <laughs> things, no, the three main things. No, the other main thing is that there is a dignity to this. And as I was saying when I started, I think I said something about how We've been sold a bill of goods that, that we're just a, sort of a fluke of nature. And I don't believe that. In my darkest moments, that feeling comes over me, but I don't really believe it. What I'm trying to say is that uh, there's a dignity and a beauty to, um, to this thing that we've all sort of committed ourselves to, sort of. You know, they used to call it like a wheel of karma, you know, and, and we're going through, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, I think Jonathan wanted to jump in. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, that uh, uh, there is a lot of dignity in, in Eric's paintings. And, um, and the question is, once again, for someone who's uh, writing about them uh, with an eye of, towards uh, understanding uh, the generation of this dignity is that maybe it comes from the tension between uh, a point of view that might be called almost deliberately archaic and a contemporary sense of abstraction, which uh, for someone who uh, moved into this apartment in Seoul in 1979 is not going to be unfamiliar with uh, uh, in New York. And so the tension between the old and the new is not something um, a lot of painters are interested in right now. We're only interested, uh, you know, in 1934, Ezra Pound wrote a book called Make It New. And that was in 1934. If you think about that, that's, that's quite a, it's not exactly a century, but it's, we're getting close. 
And um, maybe the strength of um, Eric's paintings has to do with his ability to pull from the past just as much as he embraces the contemporary and looks ahead. Wonderful. So uh, you, that leads very nicely into another question. You know, it's interesting being a moderator because you have to listen and think about while you're listening, you're thinking about what's the next question I'm going to ask, right? Doing a great so, job. Um, right, a little song and dance act here. But so I, I want to talk about painting in the larger sense, right? And this question is kind of directed to Jonathan that I want the other Eric and Ben to jump in here. So, so I think of painting both individuals and I think in, in the larger scheme about painting, like how individual painters are moving culture forward. Like, you know, what do you see ascending within painting, right? And, and I totally agree that there is, what, what, what makes Eric interesting for me is the fact that he's trying to invent a new form right. without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Right. That, exactly. you know, that he's trying, that he's doing something about painting that's important. Right, so, so it's sort of like, how does one, so how did Eric get there? And where do you think painting's going? And talk to that a bit, Jonathan, about sort of the bigger, your sense of things. Right. Um, um, Eric, well, first of all, we've got to recognize that in the last five years, uh, contemporary art has shifted uh, quite sharply away from the object towards social practice. And that this is, um, this is, this should be controversial, but it's not at the moment because it puts the, the artist ahead of the work. And one of the things that I really liked about Eric's work is that he's an artisan. He's someone for whom technique uh, is, 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 is the originating attribute of his creativity. Mm, that's true. And, um, uh, I think that that a little bit we're sort of um, struggling right now because because ever since the '60s with pop art and conceptual art and and uh, uh, sort of the art that was moving away from from image making into intellectualism, uh, someone like Eric gets a little bit lost in the shuffle, and I don't think that I think this is a problem because he's actually keeping painting alive. And painting's been going on for several millennia and does not have to put in a corner in this particular moment. So it's important that we have skilled artists uh, who are attracted to the history and the craft of good painting. And in that sense, um, uh, I am writing as often about ideas when I write now as I am about objects and, and textures and surfaces. And I think this is, um, uh, I can do it. Uh, it's enjoyable a little bit, but I'm increasingly worried about, about how powerful this uh, intellectualization of art has, 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 has become. Mm. Hey, Ben, why don't you talk about that a bit, where, where you sort of see Eric and you and within sort of the larger scheme of where painting's headed, where it's been, where you see its future. Well, I don't know. I mean, I can't speculate about that, but I, I just know what, what I represent. And, and, you know, and I see Eric as a kind of, I guess, as we said earlier, he also represents that idea of the hand and the mind, you know, mixing together, um, the, you know, thinking, um, doing, um, thinking with your hands, um, and then, and then kind of what happens in that interplay. And then, and then the sharing of that with, with other like-minded people as, as a kind of, you know, homegrown progressive activity, um, and uh, and and you know we we both believe in that, even though our work couldn't be, you know, further apart. So yeah, that's just that's 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 what I rap. That's how I roll, and that's that's just who you know that, that that's my identity. That's who I am. Um, so yeah, I I don't distinguish um, um, between thinking and doing, but I think they're both important. And then our job is to, um, to, 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 to be conscious of that and to, to be with that and, and let that carry us forward in life. Um, you know, I, I find it interesting that about 15 years ago, maybe going back 20, there was this sort of 
resurgence of representational practice. Um, more, I'm going to say something terrible, but so shoot me. But a lot of it felt like pastiches of 19th century work. And Jonathan probably knows what I'm talking about. And so there was this rise in ateliers and sort of a, a lot of tight rendering, you know, lots of naked people in bucolic settings. And uh, for me, it felt very retrograde. That they sort of, like, we're going to ignore whatever happened from the writing of that book in 1933 to 1996, and then we're just going to kind of take it from there. So for me, that didn't solve the problem. You know, I think you were sort of left with this anemic, it's also a very strong word, but I'm going to use it anyway, sort of art form that was being pushed aside, you know, in sort of to give center stage to spectacle, video, uh, gadgets, uh, social practice, performance, you know, so anything quiet worked on, you know, presented was sort of lost there. So I have a question. My question is about, um, you know, prior schools when, when, when so, you know, and I'm thinking about the group of seven, I'm thinking about the, uh, you know, the, uh, the regionalists, Thinking about when people begin to shake it up, can 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 that move us forward? Can that sort of and how do you do that? Do you do you work in isolation and fuck everybody else, or do you sorry, no French, but or do you do you sort of push it out there and how do you do that? And how you know, does that make it? There's a question. There's a question. So Eric, do you see yourself as part of something larger? You see yourself. In a school, do you see yourself as part of a movement? Do you see yourself as wanting to do that? And do we even need it? Oh, oh, well, okay, let me see where I can start. Part of me agrees with what Ben said and that, you know, we can't really say some of these things as predictions or anything like that. I do see myself as very connected to a lot of painters who, who don't paint anything like me who are really committed to trying to find uh, something more authentic. Uh, I think it was either Ben or, or, or um, the other Ben, uh, um, Ben um, LaRocca or it was um, Peter Bonner. Somebody used the word uh, pop, um, what's that phrase, pop, uh, pop-straction. So, uh, oh, and then there's also the, all the pop kind of um, representation and- uh, Zombie representation, zombie abstraction. Okay. Right, it's all styled. That's what you're saying. It's all styled. Yeah, and it's also kind of de 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 denigrating to, to, to what I, what I like, it, it's, not, it's not dignified. And when I think, uh, when, you know, when I, when I first saw Frangelico, for instance, and I mean, I just, you know, these painters were not, they weren't kids. They were, they were seriously <laughs> carrying humanity on their shoulders, you know? They, they were moving things forward. I think there are a lot of painters who have adopted, um, you know, very, very high-minded, beautiful, I understand, adapted may be the wrong word. They've grown into, um, in response to the world we live in, a very high-minded and beautiful and sincere desire to mm, maybe move things forward. As far as the world at large goes, um, it can't go on the way it's going. So. If it does, there's no point anyway, you know. So I, I, I may fool myself and all the people who I talk to, but I do believe it's, um, we're turning a corner, rounding the bend and uh, um, um, entering into a, you know, a different age. Uh, we're going through a very hard birth, birthing or metamorphosis right now. It seems like everything's falling apart and it seems like Whatever darkness out there there is, is 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 trying his best to get take complete control of everything. But I, but um, because I pay so much attention to 
something completely different than the news, which I never watch. Uh, I pay attention to spirituality, spiritual sources, books and things that are channeled. And, um, you know, you, you could, somebody could look at me and say, you know, he's completely out of his mind. And it could be, but I'm much happier this way. And according to all those sources that I pay attention to, we're, we're coming into a, a much better time. <laughs> Can anybody believe that? <laughs> well, I think and, your painting is about that. You know, I I'm think- I'm trying think, to paint that. I'm, that's yeah. what I'm trying to paint into existence. A different, uh, you know, you could say my paintings aren't realistic, but I could say, what the, what are you telling me reality is? Reality is what, what isn't necessarily what Descartes said it was. It isn't what Newton said it was. It's a whole lot different. I mean, you, you look, if you look at the ancient spiritual practices of the Hindus and you look at like, uh, and you look at quantum physics, they're, they're really all the same now. You know, if you look at uh, like, uh, what's his name? Uh, Bruce Lipton, who, who's a cellular biologist, you know, all of these things are, are these people writing and, and learning that um, the world isn't what we, it's, it's really, we, we're creating it as we go along. And so I figure that's my job. That's what I, I, I get really discouraged, you know, sometimes of course. And, but uh, you know, we all, I guess we all, we all do what I'm doing what I can, you know. But that's a big idea, you know, that's a, that's big. That's not small time stuff, you know. Well, you know, I come to think of it, I was just read what Dorothea, Dorothea Rockburn's a really good friend. And I know more and more as we get, go on in life, how come we're good friends? She wrote something in this month's rail about, you know, in her show that she's up right now, a uh, beautiful show about uh, Giotto and Giotto uh, and her feeling like that, um, you know, feeling like uh, some connection to Giotto and the idea that you're bringing uh, emotion into, in other words, it's a big idea. And I think when I first went to Europe, when I was 30, I was much older than all of my friends who had been already, but it was the right time for me to go. And I, that, like I said a second ago, prior to modern times, artists were, were grown-ups and really had, they were vision people. They were people of vision. They were pe people, who put the whole, my impression was when they painted Christianity, they weren't just painting a story, they were painting everyone's story. And they were also painting for the future. They were, they, these were very um, powerful people <laughs> with, with, with big ideas. <laughs> I'm gonna take a moment and ask if the audience, because we're almost out of time, if there's anybody from the audience who would like to speak up and just ask a question or make a comment, now is your time. Just feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. Jim Perry and Eddie, did you want to say something? We well, want to say hi to Eric. Hi, Eric. Hello. <laughs> hi, guys. It's been a long time. We hope to get in to see your show. Is it still open next week? Yeah, it'll be up through Saturday. Okay, we, we hope to get in. We, we, we haven't been into New York in two and a half, two years or, or more, but this will be the first. Because of COVID. But Eric, I find this whole thing extremely inspiring. I totally identify with what you're doing and the whole sentiments expressed here. I, I so gotta, I feel, well, could I just say something real quick before sure. it goes on? It's really scary to say this stuff in public without, you know, it's something different if you just say it to a close friend, but to say this stuff in public, I, I, it, I'm like kind of shaking inside a little cause it's, it's a little bit like, um, it's a little, it's a little odd. But it, well, you're person, daring not to be deep. ironic. So that's, that's always a challenge. I run away from irony usually, right. unless, unless it's very funny, you know? Unless Does anybody funny. else would like to jump in and say, uh, ask a question? We have a couple of minutes. Anybody from the audience? Jacqueline, did you want to say something? You seemed like you wanted to say something earlier. Unmute yourself, Jacqueline.
So in the lower left. No. You see, I'm no. not hearing you. No, she can't figure out how to unmute. Can I just say one more thing to Eric? Sure. I feel, I feel, and I, Jonathan, I've met you years ago, um, but you probably don't remember me, but I just find it really uplifting and refreshing to meet an artist and a group that is focused on the spiritual, the um, more uplifting aspects of art because it seems like there has been such a wasteland and such a negation of that aspect of creativity. So this has been very, um, I thank you for sharing all of this because it's been very reinforcing to me. Yeah, good. Am I unmuted? Yes, yeah. Jack, we hear you now, I go ahead. I just wanted to say that um, I'm relatively new to Eric's work. I think uh, I saw it first about a year and a half ago. And uh, I, I find the, um, the way in which the, uh, be it still life, a figure or trees, still life, uh, uh, representation of people or trees, which are of course three very traditional genres, whether he is working that way, um, the, the, uh, his paintings embody uh, something way beyond what they represent. Uh, they're very beautifully painted. Uh, there's a great uh, love and understanding of craft but they also carry a kind of authenticity to themselves that, uh, that is uh, to a painting whatever and in all the varied ways that painting can surface. Well, you. you know, I don't think anybody could say anything more, could really top that, Jacqueline. <laughs> I think that really about says it all. So, um, I think you should tell all your friends to come to see the show. And Jonathan, you have some closing comments you'd like to share with us? Um, yes, um, the, the word that I picked up from, uh, from the, the, the most recent uh, comments is authenticity. And um, uh, right now, we've got a lot of work in the, and, and we've got so much work being made and so little of it has authenticity. And authenticity is a perception based on intuition and, and, and long experience. And um, both on the part of the artist and on the part of the, uh, part of the artist and part of the audience. And um, for me, the most uh, powerful aspect of Eric's work is his authenticity. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Great, okay, so we're out of time. So I think you should give Eric and Jonathan and Ben thank a real you. round thank of applause. You. That was Thank a you. beautiful Thank talk. You. Thank, you. Thank you so much. The yes, show is up you. until Saturday. We are open Friday after Saturday. Thanksgiving. So if you need something to do after you've turkeyed out, come, come, come. There's a lot of joy there. I can tell you that there's a, a message there that, that just lifts you up. Thank We're going to say good night now. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks, Thank ben, you. Thanks, Eric, Thank Michael, you. Jonathan. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Happy holidays. Bye. Happy holidays. Bye. Happy Thank holidays. You, Michael. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, everybody else. All right, Bubba. <laughs> Did you say Bubba? <laughs>